Welcome to Experience Focus Leaders. I am delighted to introduce you to Miruna Dragomir, who is the CMO of Planable, a content collaboration tool for social media teams. Miruna had a fantastic story at Planable, growing it from 50 to 66,000 customers and a fantastic companies that she's worked with before in marketing, like Uber and Oracle. So welcome to the pod, Miruna. I would love to learn from you. Thanks so much for inviting me. Very excited to be here. Yeah, and when we met with one of one of our favorite mutual event organizers, Sastock, you guys were involved. They're a customer of ours as well. We had a lovely chat, and so it's really great to have you on the pod, Miruna. And I think one of the reasons that I really wanted to to chat is that you're working on something that's really front and center for a lot of businesses, whether they're SMBs or agencies or multi-location businesses that have more complexity where, hey, look, we all know ACO is not going to solve our problems. Right now, in terms of communications, we need to be where the customers are. And speaking for myself, I, I, I know it, but without proper organizations and proper tools, it's it, it becomes non-scalable, sort of once, like we call it random acts of content. And you're building a, effectively a, a way for people to do to do social media marketing at scale. As we were chatting earlier, I, I like to describe you as if Buffer and uh, Sana had a baby, you guys, you guys would be that. So tell us a little bit about how you're helping these six thousand customers scale up their social media so it actually delivers real touch points with customers at at, at, at the level that they need for it to become a source yeah. of leads or source of engagement. Yeah, the <laughs> metaphor that you made with Asana and Buffer having a baby, that's uh, beautiful. Keep it in mind. Yeah, so we help these marketing teams trying to, I don't know if coping is the right word, but it's definitely part of it um, because social media is becoming, I mean, it, it has become a very complex game for a long time now, but it is not getting easier at all. We're seeing new platforms entering the scene constantly. Some make it, some don't, but TikTok made it. For a while. We're we're (laughs) We're going to demake it We're in a fuzzy area there. One less to worry about. (laughs) Whether it's TikTok or Instagram Reels, there's this new whole type of content and type of backend operations that's happening because of it. So it's a job and a team that is is dealing with constant change. And every change that happens is changing how they work behind the scenes. And it's making their collaboration more complex. Just to give you a bit of context here, we've started, let's not forget, in since you talked about Buffer, in Buffer ages, when they started, the biggest issue for social media people, and it it wasn't really like it wasn't that big of a job back then, but the biggest issue was just getting content out there because it was Mm -hmm. something that people had to do beside other tens of of jobs. And so it was just about saving the links, saying something very briefly about whatever the content was in the blog they were sharing and putting it out there. And now it's like tens of people behind the scenes, the design, the creative, the copywriter, script editor sometimes. And even if it's the same person wearing the hat, there's collaboration that happens at every step of the way from finding videos or content that inspires them to jump on a trend or to make something similar or to adapt it to their context, to discussing the script or the idea of the post or or campaign, to obviously when you have the final copy and visual, you have all these small tweaks that happen to make sure that you're on brand, that you're consistent, that you're using the right hashtags and so on, and finally to get it live. So those are there's so and that's many just for a, that's just right for now. one channel, right? And then you've got this multiplied. I'm gonna use the reel here, and I'm gonna use the stories here, and so then you've got basically the same content. Then how do you execute that post, post production distribution that's optimized for each channel? And you're helping yes. with that journey as well, I would imagine. Yes, you have to personalize for each channel, but it's not just that. 
yeah, you basically you have to orchestrate all these channels and it's yeah. very difficult to do in makeshift ways. It's just, it gets impossible when you have multiple channels for one brand, but if you manage multiple brands, because so many businesses are, that becomes just completely yeah. chaos. You know what? It's, it's a funny metaphor again, but I, I'm going to go with it and see what happens. So I have three kids and when we had mm. one kid, I think you could keep in your head the schedule of certain things. But when you have three, they all have their school activities and extracurricular activities and friends and everything and not getting organized becomes a mess. So it feels we have about seven or eight kids here and we're like a small team trying to get the calendars and everything sorted out. And so it makes perfect sense that given the number of channels and the sophistication that's now required to break through the channels, you need the, the right tooling. So tell yeah. me these the marketers that you're dealing with, right? Like one of the words that you brought up is they're overwhelmed already. And yeah. they are like, they're running hair on fire. This is a complex issue. And then you're coming in and saying, okay, we're a marketing technology company. And we're going to solve your problems. But the problem is they already have MarTech companies are the ones that are really active on social and all the content channels. And there's this joke that there's like a lot of social and content marketers at content marketing companies talking about content marketing, right? And <laughs> this is a little bit of what we're doing here. How do you break through, right? What's the secret to building a lean business, right? Where you're not like throwing VC money into fire, yourself and are you using your own tools are you doing other things beyond that that help you get an edge in getting these marketers to pay attention to your solution yeah of course it's always marketing is such a trial and error game and it's been for us as well i joined planable six years ago in six years i've tried many things many channels many tactics there were eras in which we did only content. Um, and then we realized, okay, maybe we don't have the distribution set in place to build as much content as we do. And so we changed tactics. These days, we have some channels that are working and scaling the bottom of the funnel channels, the SEO, the PPC, and everything else is about creating value for our customer base. And we try to build we try to stay away from quantity. Like you can do tens of webinars, you can do eBooks and reports all day, but a lot of them can fail if you don't put in the work for it to research properly. Right? To, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to plan the distribution properly, yeah. which was something, it was a project of mine that was really hurting us because it felt like we know our channels, we know what to do. So we just planned the campaign, like in the topic and the idea, the launch date, and that was about it. And then every channel owner was just supposed to distribute it. And it did not work. Many of them just faded away and we didn't get the awareness and the attention that we needed. You just throw um, some stuff in there and you're like praying that it sticks and some something goes viral. But we're in the yeah. B2B world and it's noisy and without the distribution, deliberate distribution, even the best content may not go and have enough of the oomph, um, so to speak. Is that accurate? Yeah, that is accurate. And I know it's funny because you talk about distribution and planning and it sounds like these basic concepts that everyone knows about. And I knew about them. But before we actually did something to align the entire team. And I'm again, I feel like I'm using buzzwords, but to put an actual pen to paper or digital pen to digital paper to see everything that goes out on the channels that go out and the purpose of each channel and the purpose of each type of targeting, then it felt like when we want to say something, Every, it speaks throughout our entire pores. <laughs> there is no mouth of planable out there that is saying something else. And so we're making sure that everyone who we can target knows what we're doing right now. And we're one tip that I can share here is that we split our channels into a simple version of a funnel. Basically, we split them into cold, warm, and hot. 
hot being cus- active customers or active users. So they or- they're already in the app. It's the most easy base to announce something to. And then the worm are people that interacted with us, but they're not yet. They haven't converted and, and called. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. And called is the ones that never heard about us. And we create concept messages that are different from for each of these audiences well let's play let's bl- break that out let's go like specific mm-hmm. so let's say linkedin right linkedin we say something like typically maybe our sales team have, may have connected to to some people or maybe they're following the company domain and so when that could be one audience and then you're saying the audience that's so there could be customers right like we could drive customers to follow us on LinkedIn as an example, yeah. right? Like uh, the, the marketers, yeah. generally they tend to hang out there reasonably frequently. And then there is the separate audience that sort of, they're there, but we may be not super well connected with them, right? And we may need to use ads or other means to re-engage them. And then there's people that don't know we exist. So how yeah. to play it out, like what kind of content you would do for whom, and is there like something that works for everybody? Is there some, is there these universal big rock type of content that, that kind of you could wrap around the rest of the strategy? Or is this really personalized to each of those three buckets of users? No, there's loads of campaigns that are fit for all of these audiences, but you do have to personalize them. For example, we, let's say a big launch of ours was when we integrated with AI, whose wasn't. So we, when we integrated AI, that was a big campaign for us. So we did a video, we did a webinar, we did lots of content around the launch, but the campaign was for everyone. But when I'm going with social media ads to a completely new audience, I'm not saying Planable just launched AI because who's Planable and why do I care? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's equal to nothing. I can say something completely different, empower your social with AI or your AI right in your planning tool or whatever. I'm just, you know, spitballing ideas here. But I have to assume that they've never heard about Planable. When I'm reaching out to my users, I'm obviously saying, Try this now. I'm not. I don't need to convince them why that's super important. I don't need to convince them as much. They know what Planable is. They know the value. So there are concepts that you have to apply to each audience, and you have to really know them. Like for my users, we knew how much they love AI already. So adding one of those lengthy paragraphs of why AI is helpful and enhancing and time saving and so on was irrelevant. They knew that. They just wanted it more handy. So I'm speaking to their main need. Got it. So let's let's so you have six thousand users, right? Like it's a big group. Are all or six thousand paying customers, right? Are all of them paying customers? Some of them could be multi. Some of them could be yeah. multi user, obviously, since your collaboration function. So, you know, in our experience in a multi-user universe, right? Like some people are power users and other people are like, what is this tool? Oh, yeah. Why are we paying for it? There's going to be, there's going to be some skeptics and some people that are your champions. And so you've got this range of users. And I think you probably have a bit of more of a challenge versus somebody like Canva, which made its bones in Mm -hmm. social media content creation, because I think Canva originally did get started with one power user that was creating the content. So it was like as limited to a specific persona that was more like, I would say, want to be visual designer, like probably is the classical one. And it worked really brilliantly because they are like in the product. They had to publish a lot of stuff, right? You're, so you, you could have some of those folks that are Canva users, obviously in, in there, but you have more Maybe some teams are more sophisticated, maybe using you know the whole Adobe Creative Suite and other tools that are not Canva. And you, you're facilitating this collaboration. And then there's this range, right? Like that some are power mm-hmm. users, some are like, do we need this? They're just there to stay, maybe approve something occasionally. So mm-hmm. guide me a little bit on how you're switching up your communications depending on mm-hmm. the user profile within the company. Yes. Yeah, so there are, we have personas and the pro- product personas, of course, and they are quite different from one another. As you said, you in, uh, intuitively called out a few of these personas by default. The most active persona is the creators, the ones that act 
actually give life to the content. Those are the most engaged in the product and they care most about everything that we launch everything that we do because it's like where they they live it's they their main product i don't know slack is for some of us it's very central to their work life and there you, then you have like on the opposite side of things you have the approvers which probably go in once twice a month look at the content approve it and they're done first of all what we do is that we try not to overwhelm people with information, especially people that don't need that information. So approvers don't actually get a lot of communication from us unless it's, it's directly related to the approval or feedback giving experience. But even then, we, again, we don't overwhelm them with information because we expect the creators to do some education and ambassadorship within the company. They are deeply involved and they have direct interest to make and ask approvers to do it right. So that's like how we funnel the conversation. We focus on those that are most interested and that will are most likely to actually read and go through the content that we provide. And for the clients and approvers, we try to only give them essential information, super structured, uh, and only when needed. And likely more in the app than through emails or notifications, because again, it, it's not a central product to them. So they don't want to get buzzed all the time by us. Got it. Okay, so you you have a different, you, you've adapted both the product and the information load yeah. for them. And do you feel like you need to keep your 6,000 customers? That's quite a lot. Are you worried about churn? And do you feel like you need to keep educating them consistently on the value and new capabilities like AI that you're bringing? Or do you feel like, hey, we're like, once people are on, provided that power users engage, we're in, right? Like the price point is not like it's SMB friendly and the agency friendly. So it's not like going to get a... It's not a the sort of going to raise up. Hey, the, why are we paying hundred thousand dollars for social media? Okay. So it fits within the compensation structures that are going to for the role. So guide me a little bit of how are you thinking about that? Especially recent environment was not friendly to CMO budgets and marketing teams mm -hmm. in some sectors, yeah. right? I'd say B two B and had a bit of a you know, marketing recession, right? And so the, the spend went to sales, not to the not to the tools and in you know, other kind of certainly awareness budgets. So guide me a little bit. How do you think about that? We think a lot about it. It's not something it depends, of course, on the on what the tool does. But for us it's a workflow tool. So it's not actually every feature that we launch for them to use it, it requires a bit of a change in their recurring yeah. habit of doing something. Like to give you an example, until recently, we only had comments. So you could just leave a general comment to the post and say, whatever, change this, change that. Here's the section that I don't like, the, a new version of it. And then we introduced annotations and suggestions. Annotations meaning in Google, very similar to Google Docs. Specific, so you can specific select area text got it okay mm -hmm. exactly and suggestions like where you can actually do the edits yourself and and you can track the changes we've we're seeing we've seen like a difficult adoption rate there and i'm looking at recordings i'm seeing people doing exactly what leaving like changing an entire paragraph and leaving it as a comment as opposed to doing and suggest uh, mode and i I don't understand why. And then I'm thinking these people have been with Planable they're for used. maybe they're a year, to... two years now. Yeah, yeah. They're used to just, they're doing this yeah. on autopilot. For yeah. me to go in and say, look, there's a better way now to do this is I'm asking them to change a habit, to change a behavior. So it's much harder than you'd expect, even when it makes their lives so much simpler. So yeah, it depends on how big of a difference it is in their in their habits and in their and the way they they've been using the product. Like AI, that was simple. It's a button, and they can just rewrite it. And they were probably using ChatGPT anyways. Now it's in in the tool itself, so that's simple. But if it's something that's already deeply embedded into the way they work, that's a lot harder to increase adoption to. Now, 
the way we do it is we try to think in the product first. Product discovery will beat anything, anytime. Emails, experiences, webinars, any other type of content, as long if it lives in the product and it's and it's timed at the moment when the person when needs the, it most. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's it. if we so product. So it and the, the scale that you were in product has a more critical role, obviously, than some sort of a launch campaign. But what have you like? Where have you? said back to the question about worrying about churn, right? So like the advantage is if people are used to your tool, they're probably not likely to leave, right? So that's advantage of workflow yeah. tools, right? Because it's important. It's not, it's, a, it's not an easy thing to rip out, right? Like once you get them out of the spreadsheet mode or Google Sheets or Airtable type of whatever substitutes yeah. to the workflow tool. But back to... Like, where do you see the sure. risks in a business, right? Like with 6,000 customers, right? Obviously you can't go and monitor every customer yeah. at human scale. How, like, how do you think about that kind of in, in, in depth engagement and me and you, maybe even you have a super happy customers, but the, the social media department gets smaller and what do you do about that like how do you think about that and how do you how would you advise other companies that are dealing with recession type Mm -hmm. of issues like deal about that both in communication or kind of trying to help your customers justify investment in planable yeah yeah so about what you said there's uh, we have a lot of agency customers and they have big fluctuations in their client portfolio so that directly impacts the churn. They lose clients. And during this recession, that for sure happened. As you said, the marketing budgets decreased a lot. That's involuntary churn. So we, uh, (laughs) there's only so much you can do. There's a life in itself to the market that you can't really control. Of course, there is, you can help your agencies retain their clients. And that's something that we definitely feel like we have an impact on. By default, the experience with the client is, is smoother, is nicer. So clients are happier and they're more likely to stay with the agency unless a recession happens and their budgets get and cut. And then it doesn't That's, matter, right? Yeah. But so, so yeah, it doesn't so basically, matter. yeah, it doesn't, you could be the best ever, right? Like the budget is cut, but you're definitely a tool that facilitates agency communicating with their end customer yes. and creating a safe feeling for the end customer. I get it. Yes. In our experience with churn, what I can say is that focusing on churn itself is can be demoralizing because that's the end point of the journey. And that's usually where you have very, your hands are tied. The moment of churn means the person has decided they already found a new way to do whatever they were doing with you. So you can't impact that. It's too late. Even if you give them discounts, which we do, there's so many other tactics, but that saves such a small amount of churning clients. So we're focusing more in the beginning of the journey because the usually the biggest or the most frustrating churn is when people leave because they actually don't know how to use your product and they haven't been using it right. And that is the the biggest downfall of self-service type of SaaS. Because when you don't have a salesperson, when you don't have a customer success that onboards them and, and tells them how to use the product, they discover it themselves. And if they don't use it, they are likely to churn because they're not getting the value of it. So we're really focusing on onboarding and on the initial stages of the journey and on them setting the workflow right and planable from the very beginning. And that is that we have an onboarding squad. So that's a dedicated team that dedicates part of the of their time to to fixing onboarding and to constantly because it's an iterative game. And yeah, that's our main area. So got it. So the, the in the low touch products solutions like yours, you got to avoid this. You got to get like the initial upfront education before they buy. So they look at it more, allocate the resources, understand what they're buying. And then the moment they onboard is the critical moment yes. the, 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 you know, that determines what happens a year from now. Yeah, it's not necessarily 
it doesn't have to happen before they purchase because many purchase from the start when you have a lower price point they might not do so much decision making before they actually buy but like the first few months is it's like a paid trial it's they're still testing it out they're not sure because they can cancel any time the price point is low whatever it's just a we find that the first two three months of them using the product are vital to their education and to them setting up again, the workflows in the right way. Got it. That's really helpful. So on that kind of moment of getting, you get you have a long tail, obviously was a relatively affordable price point, but it's something that we discussed previously is that one of your super customers are these agencies, right? And they obviously have their own challenges, but this is a classical example of 80-20 where you know, 20% of the customers could generate 80% of revenue. And I would suppose then it's it's a bigger win if you get an agency customer on board down the road and like retention for them is obviously more critical as well down the road. So how do you think about agencies relative to your other customers? And do you target them specifically with specific campaigns and they are also busy and they are they don't have huge budgets, right? Because the margins in that business are maybe tougher than in some other businesses. So guide me a little bit on how do you get to that highly valuable customer that may not be the easiest one to get to? Yeah. So actually, this is a, a great time to ask me that because we've just started really focusing on agencies. For some reason, until now, we kept the messaging a bit more on the benefit side of things rather than on the actual target customer. What we find is that we can't really target them on the classic channels that we know in terms of they don't search. When you target an industry, they don't search like this for my industry. So it's not like social media tools for agencies or anything like that. So you can't expect them there. What we're doing is that we're tailoring the content towards this audience. We're trying to, for example, we have webinars coming up on the topics that are most interesting to them and that are really captivating for this audience. Like we have a lot of agencies that are super successful and that are founders that took an agency from zero to scale or even exiting with the agency. And we're trying with them to create the content that really attracts agency founders. Uh, I see. So um, as an agency and- founder, which you, you know, principals often make big decisions, investments in agencies quite more than some yes. other areas. Do you want to yeah. say, hey, I have a founder of this company that I exited to publicists or our our yes. friends, like we have friends at Omnicom. So we, we sold this great agency, sold it to Omnicom. Hear the story of this digital marketing agency founder and how they built it from scratch was bootstrapping and whatnot. Is that kind of the, that's where you abstract yeah. the content a little bit to that level, which yeah. says specific benefits and features of your product for agencies or for yes. the agency's customers. Yeah, 100%. And we have free tools as well. Like for example, we have a social media pricing calculator that's attractive to more beginner agencies that we also have a lot of. So we have freelancers, we have small agencies as well. And so it's it's a calculator that they can actually access and it has loads of fields like where you offer your services and what types of services you offer and so on and so forth. And it gives you a range of the price that you should that you should charge. That particular content was built as a result of a lot of research that we did. We just stalked all the groups with agency people to try to understand what their biggest pain points were. And that was one of them. How much do I charge? For my services, is that? For For my services, yeah. And particularly around social media, which is kind of your core kind of product area. Yeah. And so this is actually really fascinating because I, I do feel like the biggest challenge for most agencies is that, especially in the digital marketing world, is they say, hey, we do everything. Mm-hmm. And, we, you know, as, as somebody who's run an agency and who's like now like running a MarTag is like, really? You do everything? You, you know, how, you know, like, <laughs> you can't be great how at everything. How many people right? you are. <laughs> right? How many people are you? And are they all like unicorns, you know, that kind of like, just to run the social yeah. media thing itself, right? Like, 
you got to have a creative side for visual, a creative side for copy, hopefully get process oriented to use a tool like yours, right? Be distribution mm-hmm. savvy, measure the ROI. This is left brain, right brain, back brain, front brain, hands, arms, all yeah. working together, right? And that's just one area, right? Like we're not even talking about product marketing and we're not talking about solutions and uh, so is that kind of part of the opportunity that you could go into a broad digital marketing agency and say, look, you got a lot of things to do and we could maybe without being super expert in this, in the social area, we could make the trains right on time and could provide the resources and help you on board. Or is this people are already experts and they are gravitating to just a tool to make things more efficient? Guide me a little bit yeah. on how that plays out at the yeah. end. It, it can be a bit counterintuitive, but we actually we find that the biggest, most successful customers that we have with Planable are actually very premium agency in the social media space. The reason is that Planable is a very visual tool and it's because it's built with, as I said, super deep in, into collaboration, then the people that find most value in it is the people that really focus on every detail of that post. And that happens with these types of premium agencies that nothing gets out before people really look at it, before they they change every small detail to make it perfect. That's a niche. It's not for, there are agencies out okay, there. Okay, like just, I don't know yeah. what social media is. Like you're not for them, right? Let's go use Canva yeah, no. for beginners and they'll educate yeah. you. That's not your group. So your group is, you're at a brand savvy agency. The brand is the queen and you need to be on brand. And this gives you the precision and the control. Yes. And Adam, okay, fantastic. And like these folks, right? The devil's advocate question, right? Clearly they value what you're building, right? Because they're sophisticated. This is the brand the brand is in charge and why not charge that much, right? Like why have an affordable pricing for an audience (laughs) that attributes a lot of value to this and clearly does not need to be taught about like why social media marketing at scale is important. It's important. Yeah. First of all, agencies are not known for their, let's say, recklessness of (laughs) spending (laughs) money. (laughs) <laughs> okay. Yeah. They don't have the highest margins and so they don't necessarily have a lot of it to spend. Also, Planable is gets more expensive as the agency scales. So for agencies that have tens of customers with numerous people for each brand involved, that can become quite expensive. And so that's why we try to not make the pricing a reason why not to bring right, you want them to try it. All your clients in. got it. Mm. Yeah, so you want them to try it, and then over time, if there's enough volume and scale, it kind of all works out well for yeah. all parties, right? They see the value, and you capture some of the value that you create uh, for these folks. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Understood. Great. Look, one of the so we've talked a little bit about getting getting to specific clients, one of the things that we can have covered a bit up front is trying various marketing tactics. And I love one of your quotes from an article that you wrote in Content Grip is it goes something along the lines of sometimes it is good not to give up and keep pushing until someone notices your content. So you mentioned like there's experimentation and then there is persistence and Mm -hmm. and I, I have a feeling that the organizations that are like all about experimentation, sometimes they're just looking for this, like, this perfect channel, this unicorn channel that just magic. It's the sort of the whatever the PayPal uh, using eBay as a way to get to their customers. Like, it's just perfect and that equivalent for content. But the real life, it feels is not that simple sometimes. And so either you persist and find the right length to let the experiments run out or focus yourself at least so you're not doing 15 experiments at the same time. Guide me a little bit on how do you think about that and that trade-off 
between, hey, it's not delivering results on day one, but maybe we continue experimenting or we just, this is, there's this dog won't hunt and we need to give up on yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. First of all, you, I resonate so much with what you said. The lo- looking for that perfect channel is, it's, horrible it's a horrible journey i don't advise anyone to go on it because it's you're putting so much pressure on a tactic or on an experiment you're probably going to be disappointed in and continuously and it's because we hear these success stories and it's because we see some channels that scale and some channels are meant to scale some are just don't work like that seo yes that's for scale but if you do i don't know influencer marketing that's harder to scale it's not as easy you can't just turn on the faucet and and expect leads to just fly in and yeah on the balance of experimentation versus persistence I think, first of all, one mistake that I've found that that we've made numerous times is that we didn't actually put enough resources in the experiment. And that is in both time, the, the length of time to which you leave the experiment to run, but also like active engagement in the experiment. We expected it to show us early signs of success that allows us to motivate further investment into it. And that is, it can lead you to a very dangerous path because you can run these experiments one after the other. You're going to consider them all failures and you find yourself three years later that you ran so many experiments, but you don't really have a conclusive uh, answer to any of them. And you're disappointed that you, you didn't find anything that works. So we are really asking ourselves before deciding to run an experiment, uh, we're asking ourselves if we're ready and prepared mentally and financially and resource-wise in terms of people and time to put what it's needed into it. Like social media, for example, that's not something that you can run for a quarter. Let's see if TikTok works for us. It's not gonna. If you're gonna leave it for a quarter and if you're gonna ask someone and you're not gonna take any of their other responsibilities out of their agenda, it's not gonna work for sure. We did that. We found the same thing. We did it for a quarter, for a couple of quarters, I felt like I'm not ready to spend the resources needed in it. And so it faded away. But what I think you should do is really assess if we're if we want to try social media and make sure if that works, or if we want to try ebooks or webinar or podcasting, you need to be prepared to invest a year into it, which means that much time, that much money, that many people, and not be worried or discouraged by it throughout the year or not get cold feet and and close it after three or four or five or six months. That's, I feel like, the key to this balance of persistence versus experiment. Assess and decide on the time needed to declare it a win or loss from the get-go. Yeah, that's a fantastic insight. I think is it's what you're saying is there's this, let's throw some spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks. Mm -hmm. And Oftentimes you get a messy wall and not that much sticks versus a more deliberate approach. And I would add like from like you brought up podcast, but like I, we were reflecting on what should we invest in and like in a constraint environment. And we chose this podcast for a couple of reasons. One is it's, it's fun. <laughs> There's this, this, like literally yeah. I enjoy this, right? Like we're, it's like, us chatting at an event, we would do it and we were doing it anyway, learning about each other's businesses. And here are like two people that care about marketing and tech marketing, Mm -hmm. marketing tech kind of challenges and know these personas. And we're just comparing notes. And I think we would do this anyway. So I think there's some of this kind of DNA is like how much you're enjoying this versus this is a forced experiment. Because if you're enjoying something, loving it, it gives you strength. And for me, these interviews, like there, I'm like, I'm learning, I'm connecting with people I wanted to, like, we would want it, we were planning to connect anyway, right? Like, hey, this is a great way to do it and share in public. And maybe I took a shower today just to look a little bit more in it. So it's fun. It's fun. And then yeah. the other strategic thing, and this is where I would say, when you pick a strategy, in our case, like we're picking things that really align with our business. So actually we're using this where we, in the process of building a podcast, we're seeing this challenge that 
hey, there's a lot of podcasts out there, a lot of hours of YouTube video. We're all busy and there's not everybody who's even interested can consume every podcast. But imagine all those people that don't know you and they could be interested, but they want to take out, for example, Nugget. So we've built because we have a way to transform static content into interactive self-navigatable mm-hmm. experiences we built this we created this concept called the pod book and oh, wow. that that takes this podcast which is a known medium we didn't obviously yes. invent it right and then it's a baby between an ebook and a various <laughs> podcast formats right which could be audio only could be video only could be transcript of one and we're mixing it and we're creating the best of both worlds and maybe over time it's going to be a, a pod books of pod books right like where we create a theme of all the innovative martech companies right like you want to hear the the best of martech because that's the business that you're in here's like a collection of the books around that and we love it because we would do this anyway right like we're experimenting yeah. because this is in line with our business and it's a bit big alignment and and guess what then some customers saw it and we now have an agency that's dedicated that's a podcast agency that's mm-hmm. this is one of their differentiators wow. in that noise thing and they're reselling relate to and then some people said oh i love your pod book but i have an event can i do an event <laughs> book and so we're now doing event book so it's been so much wow. fun and so i don't like maybe you have some similar examples right because you're effectively eating your own dog food. I like the, to use the phrase, we're eating mm-hmm. our caviar and drinking our champagne, but oh. know, <laughs> it's morning now. So I'm not sure I'm that much into champagne, but, but you know what I mean? Like you, you, yeah. you're probably picking some strategies that align with the usage of your own platform. And so guide mm-hmm. us a little bit on how you're mixing the business strategy with the go-to market. Yeah, that's, I guess... Something that came to mind was that we try to, we're marketers, marketing to marketers. Yeah. (laughs) So many times you have a lot of actually value to offer that you don't even realize. You constantly go to experts and you try to maybe sometimes copy the content off of internet or something, but you have the value and the expertise in-house. So that's something that we try to do in terms of dog fooding and and a combination between dog fooding and building in public sort of yeah. like we try to do to talk about the campaigns that we launched about how we launch it like the behind the scenes like about the marketing team publicly and take people transparently through that journey that's something like that we we're doing do. right now like we're doing right now yeah <laughs> that's great yeah. exactly um, well, that's fin- we, yeah. we go ahead. Sorry. We, no, sorry. We uh, tapped into it. So again, we talk about social media a lot. And we don't do that much social media. So that's where it becomes a bit difficult. But we do have other channels in Planable. So you can connect your bl- blog and, and newsletters and everything else and create them there. So we realized, actually, we do a lot of content. So why don't we speak about our experience with content marketing? And we launched a webinar about the team at SEO. The SEO team at Planable talks about how they do SEO. And we're quite good at SEO. So that was actually something that we're confident in. And we had 300 registrants overnight when we announced it. So that was a huge success. And it it was driven by the fact that it was this lifting of the curtains type of concept. Fantastic. So you're basically, um, I I like this idea of building in the open where you're actually talking Mm -hmm. about what's behind the scenes, right? Like you're not Mm -hmm. trying to manipulate people into doing something, right? Like it forces you to be, you know, intellectually honest and really focus on, you know, what's the value for the customer. And I think that's the best marketers are creating value. They're not trying to sell you something or get you into the products you don't need. Miruna, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, everything that you've been doing. (laughs) Congratulations on the success. Um, And I love the transition as well that you've executed personally from being part of larger, well-known brands to creating a leading brand in, in, in your domain. So again, congratulations. How can our audience discover Planable and you best? 
Yeah, thanks for inviting me. This was a blast. I, I love the conversation. Yeah, it was super casual. And about me and Planable, they can find me on LinkedIn. I'm very responsive on LinkedIn, so feel free to reach out. And Planable is uh, simply planable.io. You can go in there. I'm just coming off of a workshop to revamp our uh, homepage, but in the meantime, it works as is. So <laughs> go awesome. on it and see if uh, you like it. Yeah. Niruna, thank you so much. Let's make social media that delights people at scale and and use tools like yours to make that happen for brands and agency. Thank you again, Niruna, for joining us.